Stalin still had his other duties, in addition to newer ones. He remained Commissar for Nationalities and was a member of both the Politburo and Org Bureau, for example. Murphy wrote that, quote, any one of these posts contained enough work to occupy an ordinary person 24 hours a day. Unquote. Headquarters were in Moscow now, and he had a home for the first time in a long time, comprising two or three rooms in the Kremlin. His wife, Nadezhda Alaluyeva, who he had married in February or March 1919, stayed here as well. She was now about 18, and Stalin about 40. He had known her since she was a child, and apparently even once saved her from drowning in Baku. From a modern lens, both the age gap and the fact he had been a longtime family friend definitely seem weird. There's no getting around that. But it was a different time. They also hadn't seen each other for years prior to the time they became close. And it seems clear that they truly loved each other. Quote, This was Stalin's great love affair. Ibid. Murphy noted that, quote, those in search of sexual scandal in his life will search in vain. Ibid. Murphy also recalled a kind of funny anecdote from a conversation he had with Radek. Quote, I recall Radek speaking to me of Stalin's reaction to the vagaries and often abominable aberrations in the sexual life of modern civilization. Several illustrated German books dealing with the subject lay on Radek's table, which was as usual piled with volumes newly arrived from Europe and America. Stalin was just about to leave Radek's room when he noticed these books and began thumbing over their pages. Turning to Radek, he asked, Are there really people in Europe who do these kinds of things? Yes, of course, answered Radek. Stalin, Radek said to me, looked utterly disgusted, shrugged his shoulders, and walked away without saying another word. Ibid. He reportedly liked his home life, but didn't have much time to enjoy it yet. After visiting Ukraine and Oryol, Sverdlov contracted typhus or the Spanish flu. Despite this, he continued to perform his duties. On March 14, 1919, he lost consciousness. On the 16th, he passed away. He was only 33 years old. The intervention war wasn't completely over until the last Japanese soldier left Vladivostok near the end of 1922 but the civil-slash-intervention war was mostly over by the end of 1920. The improvised and often poorly equipped Red Army had fought hard, often doing so in uniforms from the Tsarist Army, or what could be taken from the enemy. Murphy recalled, quote, I saw regiments march through the streets of Leningrad and Moscow in 1920, clad in the uniforms of almost every country in Europe, French, British, German, Polish, Russian, and many others. If ever there was an army which fought, with sweat and blood and tears, clothed in rags and tatters, on a minimum of food, and with a minimum of equipment, it was this army of the revolution between 1918 and 1922. Ibid. They were fighting for a better, socialist future, and this desire likely helped them succeed. Cunningly, some sections of the Red Army would even advance with the enemy, gathering food, clothing, and equipment, and then return to their ranks. In the countries whose governments had interfered and aided the counter-revolution, many people opposed it, sparking a hands-off Russia movement. These governments had failed in their quest to help restore power and control to the landlords and capitalists, and the triumph of the Red Army meant they had to eventually come to terms with the existence of the Soviet government, at least to some minor extent. Murphy wrote of the aftermath of the war, quote, The devastation was tremendous. I saw it. It brought in its trail hunger such as the peoples of the invading powers had never experienced. It laid great areas of the country naked for the scorching suns of 1920 and 1921 to parch completely, turning hunger into famine and bringing epidemics that affected more than 30 millions directly and the whole population indirectly. Ibid. Trotsky wanted to militarize labor and economic life, and began transforming Red Army regiments into labor battalions. He also advocated for union officials to be appointed by the government instead of being elected. In a speech, he asked, quote, What does militarization mean, if not organization? Strict execution of orders, war against idleness. Ibid. At first, the CC approved his plan, but many party members argued against it. When Trotsky began implementing his plan, quote, The immediate result was an angry storm of protest and rebellion. Gray. 
Trotsky also angered the unions. While trying to restore the rail system, he organized the railway men under army discipline against the union's wishes. He ignored their opposition again when he established his own transport authority, called the Central Transport Committee, or Tsektran. He said he would deal with other unions the same way. In Our Disagreements from January 1921, Stalin wrote, quote, Our disagreements are about questions of the means by which to strengthen labor discipline in the working class, the methods of approach to the mass of the workers who are being drawn into the work of reviving industry, the ways of transforming the present weak trade unions into powerful, genuinely industrial unions, capable of reviving our industry. There are two methods, the method of coercion, the military method, and the method of persuasion, the trade union method. The first method by no means precludes elements of persuasion, but these are subordinate to the requirements of the coercion method and are auxiliary to the latter. The second method, in turn, does not preclude elements of coercion, but these are subordinate to the requirements of the persuasion method and are auxiliary to the latter. It is just as impermissible to confuse these two methods as it is to confuse the army with the working class. A group of party workers headed by Trotsky, intoxicated by the successes achieved by military methods in the army, supposed that those methods can, and must, be adopted among the workers, in the trade unions, in order to achieve similar successes in strengthening the unions and in reviving industry. But this group forgets that the army and the working class are two different spheres, that a method that is suitable for the army may prove to be unsuitable, harmful, for the working class and its trade unions." Unquote. Closing out that section, he wrote, quote, Trotsky writes in one of his documents, The bare contrasting of military methods, orders, punishment, with trade union methods, explanation, propaganda, independent activity, is a manifestation of Kautsky and Menshevik socialist revolutionary prejudices. The very contrasting of labor organizations with military organizations in a worker state is shameful surrender to Kautskyism. This is what Trotsky says. Disregarding the irrelevant talk about Kautskyism, Menshevism, and so forth, it is evident that Trotsky fails to understand the difference between labor organizations and military organizations. That he fails to understand that in the period of the termination of the war and the revival of industry, it becomes necessary, inevitable, to contrast military with democratic, trade union, methods, and that, therefore, to transfer military methods into the trade unions is a mistake, is harmful. Failure to understand that lies at the bottom of the recently published polemical pamphlets of Trotsky on the trade unions. Failure to understand that is the source of Trotsky's mistakes." Unquote. In the next section, he noted, quote, While war was raging and danger stood at the gates, the appeals to aid the front that were issued by our organizations met with a ready response from the workers. For the mortal danger we were in was only too palpable, for that danger had assumed a very concrete form evident to everyone in the shape of the armies of Kolchak, Udinich, Denikin, Pilsudski, and Wrangel, which were advancing and restoring the power of the landlords and capitalists. It was not difficult to rouse the masses at that time, but today, when the war danger has been overcome and the new economic danger, economic ruin, is far from being so palpable to the masses, the broad masses cannot be roused merely by appeals. To rouse the millions of the working class for the struggle against economic ruin, it is necessary to heighten their initiative, consciousness, and independent activity. It is necessary by means of concrete facts to convince them that economic ruin is just as real and mortal a danger as the war danger was yesterday. It is necessary to draw millions of workers into the work of reviving industry through the medium of trade unions built on democratic lines. Only in this way is it possible to make the entire working class vitally interested in the struggle, which the economic organizations are waging against economic ruin. If this is not done, victory on the economic front cannot be achieved. In short, conscious democracy, the method of proletarian democracy in the unions, is the only correct method for the industrial unions. Forced democracy has nothing in common with this democracy." Unquote. Finally, he concluded by saying, quote, In order to retain and strengthen the confidence of the majority of the workers, it is necessary systematically to develop the consciousness, independent activity, and initiative of the working class, 
systematically to educate it in the spirit of communism by organizing it in trade unions and drawing it into the work of building a communist economy. Obviously, it is impossible to do this by coercive methods and by shaking up the unions from above, for such methods split the working class, the sectran, and engender distrust of the Soviet power. Moreover, it is not difficult to understand that, speaking generally, it is inconceivable that either the consciousness of the masses or the confidence in the Soviet power can be developed by coercive methods. Obviously, only normal methods of proletarian democracy in the unions, only methods of persuasion, can make it possible to unite the working class, to stimulate its independent activity, and strengthen its confidence in the Soviet power, the confidence that is needed so much now in order to rouse the country for the struggle against economic ruin. As you see, politics also speak in favor of methods of persuasion." Unquote. Lenin, along with 10 of the 19 CC members, including Stalin, Zinoviev, and Kamenev, wanted Sektran abolished. Trotsky condemned their policies as liberal and was supported by Buharin, Zerzhinsky, and the three members in charge of the party secretariat at the time. The question would be decided at the 10th Party Congress in March 1921. Lenin, Stalin, and others also opposed the syndicalist policy of a group of workers led by Shlyapnikov, which maintained that trade unions were the highest form of working class organization and wanted the whole national economy in the hands of an all-Russian producers congress. The masses had tolerated the poor conditions during the civil war, but in the aftermath, there was unrest. People were hungry, and the peasants wanted the grain requisitioning policy put to an end. What is often referred to as war communism, but wasn't actually communism, of course, had been necessary to feed the Red Army, but things were different now. There were even some revolts and strikes. For example, a peasant revolt in the Tambov region had to be put down by Red Cavalry and Special Army units under Tuhachevsky in April 1921. Order was not restored until the fall. The best known of these rebellions was the Kronstadt Mutiny. In March 1921, soldiers and sailors from the fortress town of Kronstadt, many of them from peasant backgrounds, started an armed uprising against the Soviet government. It lasted for two weeks, but it was eventually suppressed. It's often presented, especially by anti-communists, as something heroic and worthy of praise, an example of supposed Bolshevik tyranny and a rebellion from the left. But the evidence contradicts all of this. Much later on, Yeltsin, potentially the most hated president in Russian history, opened the archives on Kronstadt to researchers, expecting they would reflect his positive presentation of the mutiny. This completely backfired on him. There were over a thousand documents, including first-hand accounts by mutineers, secret white guard reports, articles, memoirs, etc., collected from various Soviet, white guard, Menshevik, anarchist, and Western capitalist sources. For one thing, capitalist media was already praising the so-called rebellion two weeks before it even started. Stepan Petrochenko, the leader of the mutiny, had been in the Red Army, but was a Ukrainian nationalist who presented himself as an anarcho-syndicalist. He had actually tried to join the White Army a year prior, and was arrested more than once on suspicion of counter-revolutionary activity. He bragged about this to an American journalist. And this is according to an anarchist historian named Average. Average discovered a memorandum on the question of organizing an uprising in Kronstadt from the White Guards. Not too long after the rebellion, there was clear evidence that those responsible for it were either Whites themselves or working with the Whites. There are mountains of evidence for this. There had already been unrest, and a spontaneous component partially helped lead to it but the Whites and their collaborators exploited this and escalated the situation. Bogus rumors of workers being shot and factories being bombed were disseminated in Kronstadt, and the reactionaries took advantage of this, spreading them further. When disturbances in Petrograd had actually stopped, they were drafting an announcement claiming there was a general insurrection there. They continued this dishonest behavior throughout, like when they falsely claimed that 2,000 armed communists were coming to attack their meeting and even having the present communists arrested. The Provisional Revolutionary Committee, which Petrochenko falsely told people was elected by soldiers, was never elected at all. Moreover, it was comprised of opportunists 
capitalists, and counter-revolutionaries, including two Mensheviks, a cadet party member, a supporter of the cadet party, a black market speculator, a former police detective, two ex-capitalists, property holders, and Petrochenko. Petrochenko was welcomed warmly by white reactionaries upon fleeing to Finland. They were counter-revolutionaries through and through, but they fooled some people into thinking they were some sort of revolutionaries. One of their slogans seems to reveal their true motivations. Quote, For the Soviets! Without the Communists. Gray. In an interview with the correspondent of the New York Herald, Lenin noted that the revolt was not a real threat to Soviet power, saying, quote, This Kronstadt affair in itself is a very petty incident. Unquote. He also said, quote, Some people in America have come to think of the Bolsheviks as a small clique of very bad men, who are tyrannizing over a vast number of highly intellectual people, who would form an admirable government among themselves the moment the Bolshevik regime was overthrown. This is a mistake, for there is nobody to take our place save butcher generals and helpless bureaucrats, who have already displayed their total incapacity for rule. Unquote. Murphy experienced some of the trickery firsthand. Quote, They were inflamed by the whites centered in Helsingfors and Rival. This I know from personal observation. As I passed through Rival on my way to Petrograd several weeks before the revolt burst forth, the newspapers of Estonia and Finland were full of reports of uprising in Kronstadt and Petrograd. The people of Rival were excited by the so-called news. I was urged by friends not to proceed with my journey. I was told that Petrograd had been seized by the Whites. The Tsar's flag was again flying over the Winter Palace. Civil war was raging. But on arriving in the city several days later, I found all quiet. Thus, it is no exaggeration to say that the Whites were fanning the discontent, which undoubtedly existed, into open warfare." Unquote. Indeed, though counter-revolutionaries had exacerbated the situation and were responsible for the revolt itself, the discontent among the people was very real and understandable. Lenin said, quote, This was the flash which lit up reality better than anything else. Gray. Russia before the wars was already a backwards, semi feudal country, but now it had been through the Great War and the Civil Slash Intervention War. People were suffering from hunger, production was at a low, the economy was in shambles, and the tattered surroundings bore the scars of war. Murphy wrote, quote, Nothing could be more drab and colorless than Petrograd as I saw it in 1920." Unquote. The Bolsheviks had to do something. The answer was the New Economic Policy, or NEP. Quote, How the press of the world rejoiced over what was interpreted as the abandonment of the Bolshevik program and the return to capitalism and sanity. Ibid. But the Bolsheviks had not betrayed the revolution. Their goal was still firmly in mind. The NEP wasn't necessarily what they wanted to do, but it was a necessary measure, and a temporary one at that. The dictatorship of the proletariat would be maintained, and the state would hold on to areas like the banks, railways, telegraphs, postal services, large industrial enterprises, and foreign trade. However, small private enterprises would be re-established, as would free market conditions for the exchange of commodities. Requisitioning rates were done away with, and the peasants could sell any surplus they produced over the tax and kind they gave to the state. Lenin, being very honest about the situation, referred to this as a kind of state capitalism. However, Murphy argued that, quote, The NEP therefore consisted of a mixture of socialist and capitalist economy. The state-owned section of economy was socialist, but had to struggle in a milieu of capitalist market conditions, to enter into competitive relationships and commodity production, and be subject to their characteristic fluctuations. Ibid. Many party members were initially against the NEP, but it was approved at the 10th Party Congress nonetheless. Now that the wars were over, and the constraints they had to deal with were recognized, focus shifted to production and improving conditions. It was a challenge, especially considering revolution had not triumphed elsewhere, as hoped. Quote, now the call was for builders of industry, pioneers of construction, accountants, managers, educationalists, people who could teach illiterate peasants to become industrial workers and, in short, could heave the masses from their degradation and abysmal ignorance to the level of industrial society of the 20th century. Ibid. 
Lenin was also working on a plan for the electrification of Russia. Stalin wrote to him about it in March 1921. Quote, It is a masterly outline of an economic, a really constructive plan, a real state plan, in every accepted sense of the word. It is the only real Marxist attempt of our times to put the superstructure of Russia, so economically in arrears, on a really true industrial technical basis, only possible under existing conditions. My advice? First, not to waste one moment more in chattering about this plan. Secondly, to begin carrying the scheme out immediately in a practical manner. Thirdly, to subordinate at least one-third of the available labor to the interests of the commencement of this new work. Fourthly, as the collaborators of the plan, in spite of all their good qualities, are nevertheless lacking in practical experience, practical men must figure on the plans commission. Fifthly, the newspapers Pravda, Izvestia, and especially Economy Cheskaya Zhizin must devote themselves to popularizing the electrification plan, both so as to bring it to everyone's notice and to give all material details about it. Ibid. There were other important developments at the Congress, which was held from March 8th to 16th. Lenin's Platform of Ten gained the support of a large majority early on, while Trotsky's idea of using war communism to rebuild the economy was defeated. Lenin introduced resolutions on trade unions, democratic centralism, elections to all posts, and one that stated that members should be able to take, quote, an active part in the life of the party, Gray. He moved two new resolutions on the final day of the Congress, one concerning party unity and one called the syndicalist and anarchist deviation in our party. The latter rejected the claim that trade unions should control industry. Both were approved by a vast majority. Trotsky's plans for labor militarization, subordination of unions, and increased centralization of power were defeated. Due to his proposed policies and the campaign against them, his reputation took a further hit. In addition, quote, his public conflict with Lenin had lowered his standing with members, among many of whom he was personally unpopular. Gray. However, he did keep his spot on the CC, though supporters of his platform were not re-elected. After the Congress, quote, he took no direct interest in the building of the party organization. Gray. Gray described Stalin's role in the Congress as, quote, unobtrusive, unquote though he did play a significant part in the campaign against Trotsky leading up to the Congress. He was, of course, a member of the Platform of Ten, and came out of the Congress with greater authority. At this time, he was also a full member of the Central Committee, the Politburo, and the Org Bureau. He remained Commissar for Nationality Affairs, and was People's Commissar of State Control, later renamed the Workers' and Peasants' Inspection, or RABGRIN, from 1919 to 1922. Quote, he had always shown a remarkable ability for shouldering a multiplicity of responsibilities. Gray. At the 11th Party Congress in March to April 1922, Eugene Preobrazhensky questioned whether anyone could handle two commissariats plus party work, and he referred to Stalin specifically. Lenin acknowledged the difficulty, but said, quote, These are all political questions. We are resolving them, and we have to have a man to whom any national representative can go and explain in detail what the problem is. Where can we find him? I don't believe that Preobrazhensky could name any candidate other than Comrade Stalin. The same applies to Rabgren, a gigantic job. But in order to cope with the inspection work, you have to have at the head of it a man with authority. Otherwise we'll bog down and drown in petty intrigues. Gray. Preobrazhensky, Krestinsky, and L.P. Serebriakov were, quote, closely associated with Trotsky. Ibid. They had been in charge of the Secretariat since March 1920, but were not re-elected to the CC at the 10th Party Congress in March 1921, and their positions in the Secretariat and Org Bureau were vacated. This opened up spots for some of Stalin's friends and supporters. Voroshilov and Orjana Kidze were elected to the CC, and Molotov became a full member. Valerian Kwebyshev and Sergei Kirov, young party workers and Stalin supporters, were elected as well. Molotov became one of the three members of the Secretariat. By 1921, the party's membership had grown to almost 700,000. However, it's not just quantity that matters, but also quality. And in this situation, around 160,000 people were expelled in a purge conducted by the CC. Some have apparently tried to blame Stalin for this, but it was not his measure. 
It was done under Lenin's leadership and was a relatively normal part of party procedure. As Murphy said, quote, it is the means of guaranteeing Bolshevik quality. To regard it as a desperate move on the part of leaders anxious to get rid of rivals is to misunderstand how profoundly the Bolshevik party differs from all others, even from the communist parties of the rest of Europe." Unquote. This was carried out at open meetings where non-party members were allowed to participate. Murphy explained that, quote, On these occasions, each group or branch of the party holds a meeting, and every member, no matter what his rank, is under obligation to review his history before his comrades, to tell of his social origin and circumstances, and his political career, to explain his views on party policy, to recall his practical work, to admit his mistakes and explain them. Ibid. After this, the meeting would make its decisions and suggestions to the Party Control Commission. Self-criticism and admitting mistakes would become a common feature in many Marxist parties. Quote, the Bolshevik is called on to review his own activity objectively, to recognize that he is a social unit in a great social process. Ibid. Lenin commenced the first big purge during the transition from war communism to the NEP. In 1922, he said that, quote, the party had rid itself of the rascals, bureaucrats, dishonest or wavering communists, and of Mensheviks who have repainted their facade, but who remained Menshevik at heart. Ibid. At the Congress the same year, Stalin was elected to the position of General Secretary, and he was still Commissar of Nationalities in addition to his other responsibilities, of course. His attention had been pulled away by the Civil War, but he had resumed work on it in the spring of 1920. Pestovsky, who would become his first secretary in the Commissariat, wrote about Stalin's handling of the department. Quote, there were Lettish, Polish, Lithuanian, Estonian, and other elements in the council of his secretariat. They were afflicted with the ideas of left Bolshevism. I myself belong to that faction. I am almost certain that Trotsky, who accuses Stalin of dictating, would in three days have dispersed the oppositional council and surrounded himself with his own followers. But Stalin acted differently. He decided to educate us by slow and persistent efforts, and displayed much discipline and self-control. He had his conflicts with individual members of the council, but was loyal to the body as a whole, submitted to its decisions even when he disagreed, with the exception of such cases where there was a violation of party discipline. Then he would appeal to the central committee and, of course, carry his point. Ibid. Stalin went to Baku in November 1920, his first time back in the Caucasus in years. Orjanikidze led the Caucasian Bureau, or CAV Bureau, of the CC, created in April 1920. In May, Orjanikidze sent Lenin and Stalin telegrams, suggesting that Red Army soldiers march into Georgia. Due to the situation with the Civil War, the Politburo responded in a telegram, signed by Lenin and Stalin, that invasion was off the table, and that he should negotiate with the Georgian government, led by Noe Jordania, a Menshevik. A treaty was apparently signed, but this would not be the end of it. On November 30th, 1920, an interview with Stalin was published in Pravda. He proclaimed that, quote, the Georgia that had enmeshed itself in the toils of the Entente and was consequently deprived both of Baku oil and of Cuban grain, the Georgia that became the main base of imperialist operations by Britain and France, and hence entered into hostile relations with Soviet Russia, this Georgia is now living out the last days of its existence. Gray. In December 1920 and January 1921, Orjana sent telegrams to Lenin asking for the seizure of Georgia, which everyone in the CAV Bureau approved of. Lenin responded that the time was not right. However, progress eventually came when Stalin took up the proposals. He proposed to the CC that Orjana organize an armed uprising, and that the Revolutionary Military Committee stand by to provide help. He wrote a postscript saying, quote, I request a reply before 6 o'clock. Unquote. Lenin acted quickly, adding, quote, not to be delayed, unquote, to the letter. Gray. The Red Army, on decision of the CC, officially moved into Georgia around February 15, 1921, to support the uprising. This also led to a feud between Orjanikidze and Budu Imdivani, who led the Georgian Bolsheviks. The ultimate result was Bolshevik victory and the establishment of the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic.